If we show emotion, we're called dramatic. If we dream of equal opportunity, we're delusional. When we're too good, there's something wrong with us. And if we get angry, we're hysterical, irrational, or just being crazy. But a woman running a marathon is crazy. Officials tried to pull her off the course. A woman boxing was crazy. A woman dunking, coaching an NBA team, landing the impossible, or winning 23 Grand Slams, having a baby, and then coming back for more. Crazy, 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 and crazy. So if they want to call you crazy, fine. Show them what crazy can do. So I'm so happy to share my favorite video with you and welcome our superstar faculty. We have Dr. Jean Carruthers from Vancouver, Dr. Fiona Costello from Calgary, and Dr. Jill Foster from Columbus, Ohio. So thank you superstars for being with us today and start off and launch our women ophthalmology session with a bang here. So Women Ophthalmology in Canada is uh, part of the COS, but we also are sisters to the U.S. organization Women in Ophthalmology USA, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be part of that organization. We just launched Women Ophthalmologists Worldwide, wow, um, last weekend, and it creates a network for women to support each other and learn from each other. So I'm really excited to share that news with you. The goals, of course, for women ophthalmology worldwide were to, are to support equity through community, collaboration, outreach, and networking. So let's go back to last year, Women Ophthalmology 2019. And here we are in Quebec. And remember, it was the day after our Raptors made NBA history. And um, we were really social distanced, as you can see in this photo. So um, I want to just uh, remind you all of that. And now I'm going to just share some interesting slides about how women are in Canada and some demographics and population numbers. So let's go through this. About according to the 2018 uh, CMA, Canadian Medical Association uh, Statistics Profile in Ophthalmology, we have about 1,249 Canadian ophthalmologists, men and women combined, and that puts us at an average of 3.4 per 100,000. And that's actually going down uh, if we look at the trend. And so it is very important that we keep training our residents and fellows. Um, if we look at this uh, diagram here, we can see that 27% of our population of ophthalmologists are women. And we can see that uh, the great majority of them are younger ophthalmologists. And you can see in this lower uh, line, the light blue, uh, this, um, this slide shows us that there is a steady increase correlating with our uh, larger population increase uh, that correlates to with women growing. It's also nice to see this graph, which shows that the great, in the youngest population, less than 35, we have almost equal men to women, and slowly we are seeing uh, uh, some increase in our numbers because of that. So we are really looking at the younger ophthalmologists that are uh, the greater proportion of the women ophthalmologists in Canada. So I'd like to now introduce Dr. Jean Carruthers. As you can see, she's a runner, Vancouver Marathon runner there. And she uh, is a great mentor for uh, so many of us. Um, she is a mother of three and has really been a role model for us all. She's a clinical professor at University of British Columbia. She received her medical degree from UBC in 1971, completed her ophthalmology residency at, uh, at the Institute of Ophthalmology in Moorfield Eye Hospital in 1977, completed her postgrad studies in ophthalmology at UBC and University of California in 1982. She's authored over 300 articles with her and her husband, Alistair. She's edited 
nine books and has received numerous awards. She's won an Aesopers Award. She's won the Dermatology Award. She's won so many accolades in, um, in our profession and in uh, collaborative professions. So we're very honored to have Jean share her experience with us all today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Carruthers. So Dr. Chin. So Dr. Carruthers' uh, presentation is just getting up. So while it's getting up, um, I'm just gonna share uh, one more great information that Dr. Carruthers is being awarded uh, the Champion of Change Award from the Canadian Ophthalmology Society. So this is a new award that uh, has been created and we've had this award in Women Ophthalmology US. And so we'd like to present Dr. Carruthers this award for the Champion of Change in recognition of her outstanding contribution to supporting the professional environment for women in ophthalmology. So if you could join me in congratulating Dr. Carruthers, I know it's not as fun as being together, but this is still a great way for us to recognize and acknowledge her contribution. Thank you, Jean. I'm going to let you share um, your slides now for your presentation. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Fumita. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's uh, really wonderful to be uh, in introduced by Famita, who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. Uh, nobody has put together such a successful 30, 40 woman journal club, which goes on month after month, year on year with full attendance, just so fantastic. And all your efforts with women ophthalmology, amazing. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit emotional. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful award. I wanted to talk a little bit about what Alistair and I have done over the years. And you can see he's um, not only taller than me, he's smarter than me. <laughs> so these are my disclosures. I've worked with quite a lot of people. Um, so what is an aha moment? Um, an aha moment is the moment or instance at which the solution to a problem or other significant realization becomes clear. And here's a fanciful drawing of Archimedes in his tub in the second century BC. Um, it's a 16th century woodcut, so there's a little distance between the artist and the, uh, the inventor. But that was an aha moment, uh, the uh, discovery of buoyancy. Here's another aha moment, which probably I'm more familiar with than many of you, because I like to get places fast. And uh, oh, the rear view mirror, it's a guy. I'll put my lipstick on. That's another good aha moment. Sometimes it will work. There are four defining features of an aha moment. It comes on you suddenly. It's, it's easy. It feels positive. And you're convinced it's true. There's just absolutely no way it could not be. So you're stuck and then suddenly it's, it's, uh, it's, it's over. You, you, you're ready to go and, and sort that out. So we, um, we were privileged to uh, do some of our education in um, not only in England, but also in the United States. Alistair had a Mohs Fellowship with uh, Sam Stegman, Ted Tromovich, and Rick Glogow in San Francisco at UCSF. And at the same time, I had a little fellowship with Dr. Alan Scott at Smith Kettlewell in San Francisco on botulinum toxin. And I was fascinated to, to work with this amazing, amazing man. And Alistair and I then subsequently have realized that our fellowships not only shaped both our lives, but my fellowship came along and actually involved him. So it was Alan Scott has a lot to answer for. Here's Alistair in 1982 and our three little boys at that time. Uh, really wonderful. I'm so blessed to have such a lovely family. 
I always believe we should honor our mentors. And uh, Ted Tromovich and Sam Stegman, uh, in particular for Alistair, were absolutely amazing and had ideas that said, has your wife done anything with that poison of hers? It was, uh, that was the, sort of the first introduction into dermatology. Here's my mentor, Dr. Alan Scott, who's still alive and well in San Francisco. And still, this picture was taken in 1982. And you can see that he has no gloves on, which tells you it's 1981 or two. And you can see how young he looks. And actually, he still looks the same. Uh, absolutely amazing. And he's still just as brilliant. So this was his first EMG machine that he and Carter Collins put together to record from eye muscles, which are different to facial muscles. And he was going to inject this molecule, botulinum toxin A, into the extraocular muscle of a child with strabismus. And the child was uh, anesthetized with some ketamine. And so this is this, this is the same, um, the same um, EMG machine. Uh, it's a little black box. This is the 200 unit vial that I used to pick up at the Canadian border. And the customs would say to me, so what is this stuff? And I'd say, oh, it's just organic. And they would let me bring it in. Nobody had heard of it before. Well, the eye muscles are different from uh, facial muscles because the motor end plate is an aggregate, aggregate further back from the insertion, maybe as far as an inch back from the insertion. So you need what Art Jampolsky and Alan Scott had designed with the, elect with the EMG machine and also the injecting needle, which was Teflon coated and hollow so that you not only knew you were in the motor end plate, you could hear it because the machine roared when you asked them to uh, activate the muscle and you knew that was the right place to inject the botulinum toxin. So this was something that was brand new and Alan and I were thought to be absolutely crazy. Uh, and, but this was so helpful. Here's a young lady who fell off her horse and she's got a left lateral rectus palsy. All you need to do is soften the action of the ipsilateral medial rectus with some botulinum toxin and she's got single vision in primary and can lead life uh, in a more normal way until the lateral rectus uh, paresis recovered. Uh, I used it for nystagmus and in some cases of congenital motor nystagmus, uh, it was very, very helpful. And in some of the neurological cases of, uh, of nystagmus as well, really improved patients' lives. But this was the real winner, their blepharospasm. People have 20-20 vision. They cannot cross the street, earn a living, drive a car, uh, go grocery shopping without help. And then this is the botulinum toxin uh, releases the uh, overaction of the orbicularis and restores them to normal life. And I, this was, it was one of these patients, uh, and this is another uh, one of my patients who had MESH syndrome, which is uh, the whole galaxy of uh, blepharospasm plus upper body and neck and hands uh, and arm spasms. And you can see it's, uh, it's uh, in the early 80s because this is Professor Andy Eisen, the head of, uh, head of neurology. He's not wearing gloves. And he's got this EMG uh, machine hooked up. It looks like an Assyrian door god. It's such a big one, way bigger than my little Alan Scott one. And so this into the neck muscles, nowadays the neurologists don't use uh, EMG to get in. But this was our receptionist, Kathy Bickerton. And she had seen, I got the approval to go ahead from Health Canada in 1982, I did the fellowship, and in May of 83, I had approval to go ahead and join Alan Scott's multi-center trial. And here's Kathy, by three in the afternoon, she looked pretty tough. And uh, she, um, when she was at rest, it wasn't a whole lot better. And then here she is after uh, 30 units of botulinum toxin, uh, attempting to frown and at rest. You can see already a change in um, her resting line. And this was, she was so happy to do this because she'd seen all my patients come in always on time, always grateful, uh, always happy with the results. Um, and so she said, sure, whatever. But she's the first cosmetic patient in the world. And little did we know that this was going to uh, unleash something so much bigger than either of us thought. Um, 
we did a study then, once we'd seen what happened with Kathy, we did a study. It took us from 1987 to 1990 to get 18 patients. And all of the patients would say, oh, but that's a terrible poison, isn't it? I, do you really think I should have that injected? And so we injected me. And this is what I used to look like. And uh, Becky Fitzgerald in, uh, in Los Angeles sent me this. I haven't frowned since 1987, which is still true. <laughs> and uh, so I would show the patients this picture and then push my bangs back and say, what do you think? And they'd say, do it. So that's how we got um, to learn how to, yeah. how to encourage people to embark on this journey. This was our first paper and we gave the paper at the ASDS annual meeting um, in um, Lake Buena Vista in Florida. And at the end of the meeting, of the presentation, there was this deadly silence in the room. I'm not used to that. People usually react to, in some way to my talks. And one of our esteemed colleagues came up and said, that's a crazy idea. That will go nowhere. Well, you know, this was a bad time for him to say that because the boomers are here. The boomers in uh, born 46 to 64 are all in their early 40s. They're coping with their kids. They're coping with their adult parents. They're coping with six jobs. And they are starting to look careworn and tired. And at the same time, we came along with botulinum toxin. Ted Tromovich and uh, Arnie Klein came along with injectable bovine collagen. So this was a, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, incredible time of creativity uh, in um, the um, late 80s. So it just so happened too, that with the boomers, uh, there are 76 million boomers. But what is so interesting is that from the Pew Research Institute, you can see that there are all kinds of other mindsets that come from uh, after the boomers. And Generation X and Y largely have not been interested in, um, in uh, the treatments, but certainly are now. Uh, at the time in the late 80s, there were all kinds of media catching up with us. Injections of deadly poison can wipe out those worry lines. Essentially, the medical world really wasn't excited about this at all, but the media were so excited about it. And uh, here's Patsy. From <laughs> and so that, that sort of encapsulates it nicely. And here's another way. Just looking on the bottom left, you can see week four now, week eight, week 12, week 16. And I'll play that again, uh, just on one side. Baseline, day seven, day, week four, week eight, week 12, week 16. And you can see it's a dynamic thing so that uh, we, we've done lots of studies since then using patient reported outcomes. And the PROs all uh, reflect what the level of the, the brow is or the result of the wearing off of the neuromodulator is. But you can see too, just looking at this beautiful young lady, the stubble that's underneath her brow. And that is an absolute giveaway that uh, she uh, is very aware of this uh, low brow situation herself. There were lots of aha moments as we went through. First of all, we had this gentleman who was a computer salesman who had pretty terrifying frown lines at rest. But when he frowned, he became absolutely menacing. And so his sales dropped off because everybody was, was scared of him. And so neuromodulators were really wonderful in saving him. The horizontal forehead lines were a real learning experience for us because of the vertical brow balance. We used to think that having uh, nice smooth forehead lines was a good result, but it isn't really when you see how much brow ptosis we've given him. And certainly we have to be much more careful now. And then this young, um, this beautiful young lady, her brows have come down when we treat her horizontal forehead lines, much less needed in the horizontal forehead lines uh, relative to the brow depressor muscles. And then this little, the bunny lines, these came out as was called the Botox sign. 
uh, because the other muscles in the, the uh, glabella are not working and the brain sends messages to all the adjacent muscles. Very interesting. But then we got interested in facial shaping. Here's a young lady who weighs about 90 pounds and feels she looks fat when she smiles. So we put two units in each of her pretarsal orbicularis muscles and 12 on the right side for her crow's feet. And you can see her before and her eyes afterwards. You can see two units it does widen the left eye, but it widens it a lot more if you inject the crow's feet. And here's her smiling. And you can see her eyes are much wider in the after photograph. So this has been a popular treatment with some of our, our patients. Then another thing we learned is that men have much larger facial muscles than women. Men have an average of 27 more pounds of muscle on them than we do. And this also in, is in their facial muscles. So we did dose ranging studies in 2005 on both men and women. And I'll show you the results. With the women, 20, 40, 60, 80, we were, we, 80 was, uh, um, I'm sorry, with the women, 10, 20, 30, 40, we have a nice dose ranging curve if you look at the white. But in the men, 20, 40, 60, 80, we actually never even reached the top and our hearts were in our mouths with the 80 units and now we regularly treat men with 100 to 120 units because they have so much more muscle. And here's a sort of pattern that we would use to treat, uh, to treat a man. Now the lower face, in the olden days, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, people thought that Botox was, uh, and neuromodulators for, were for the upper face and fillers were for the lower face. But the Mona Lisa doesn't think so. And if you use um, neuromodulator in the pars mandibularis of the platysma, and also use filler, uh, and also uh, use energy-based devices to lift, you can get a beautiful result with combination therapy. And we've all realized that getting into uh, combinations is way more powerful. Uh, this is another study we did. It was a 90-woman study we did with Gary Monheit. And uh, this was 30 women in just filler, it was the Juvederm family, 30 women just Botox and 30 women both. We had four women come to us and say, can we please be randomized to the both? So the message is out there in the public as well. But you can see with, with the just the filler that there is a nice, a nice result, but it's not a home run. Whereas this is the both. You can see in her before, she's got the vertical lip lines. She's got the downturned mouth corners. She's lost some volume. Uh, around here. And here she is week 24 on the both group. And you can see why those four women wanted to be randomized to the both group. And another thing that we discovered works so well together is treating the jowl. You have a lot of people who have this little poached egg jowl here. They don't really want to have a facelift because they're afraid of it looking pulled and done. Uh, so you can help them putting uh, Belkyra in a small amount of Belkyra in the jowl. It tightens the skin as well, which is fantastic. You call it Kybella in the United States, Jill. And uh, then we put 20 units in the pars mandibularis of the platysma and five in the pars modularis of the platysma. And you can get a shrinkage of the jowl and a nice clear jawline it, without surgery. And it's, uh, it's something that's been one of our most popular indications and uh, another thing is adding botulinum toxin to energy-based devices in surgery. What's wrong with that? And so we've uh, published on this, and I think with, and one of the most popular is intense pulse light. We did this study, full-face IPL, with 30 units of botulinum toxin, a Botox it was, on a botulinum toxin in the crow's feet. You can see when it's working that the eye is wider uh, the, the lid palpebral aperture is wider. And you can see after the neuromodulator is starting to wear off that the lid becomes uh, narrower. But there was a 15% improvement in the pigmentation in the people who got the neuromodulator compared to the people who got a placebo. Another a micro uh, monopolar radio frequency or thermage uh, with uh, and adding Botox. This is four months later. Uh, nice combination. And with my facelift patients, 
the pars mandibularis pulls against your incision line. Uh, and so you really need to weaken the, the down pulling uh, muscles so that you get a really thin, fine facelift scar. So that we had a very exciting um, international consensus panel and uh, everybody from uh, the States and Europe. And I think this is, that was 2016. So it's really in the mainstream now. So what I'm really talking about is the injectable revolution uh, led initially with Sam Stegman's model of skin aging. Uh, and then he with Arnie Klein investigating bovine collagen. And then Alan Scott uh, exploring botulinum toxin uh, ophthalmologically and in blepharospasm. Alan, to give full credit, actually thought about treating cosmetically, but he didn't yeah. see any cosmetic patients. So it was over to Alistair and me from the 80s until now the 20s where we've just really felt that we were given the most amazing privilege to clinically walk into a dark room and switch the light on and find so many fascinating um, new applications. Uh, so there was a huge contrast over the years. I got used to my colleagues thinking I was crazy. Jean, why didn't you stay being a pediatric ophthalmologist? You were really good. <laughs> but once you see one patient like our receptionist go from this, this amazing frown seamlessly to this totally different person, that woke me up to the magic of beauty and the magic of looking your best so that you can be your best. And we had all our colleagues, besides the crazy idea that will go nowhere, they should accept the facial changes and grow gracefully. Well, what is that? I love James Surowiecki's book, The Wisdom of Crowds, because the crowds were actually with us. In attitudes have changed, though. There's a, a huge change since 2012 when I did this TED Talk. Uh, I was advised by the very smart people who run TED, uh, listen, you can't talk about cosmetic because the audience are all generation X and Y, and they don't like cosmetic because it doesn't apply to them. So I switched around and I led into it by saying, we did such um, an amazing job, all of us, in the cosmetic world, that the world woke up to how safe this injection was, as well as how effective. And maybe it could be of use in other specialties. So that's how I sold it in that talk. But uh, I think I think really um, it's, it sells itself. I have to go back to Charles Darwin. Uh, he, 1872, Darwin had recognized that there were muscles of grief. And this is a picture that is sent to me as one of Ada Trindade de Almeida's patients in Brazil. And it's called the Omega Melancholium by and Charles Darwin. You can see the Omega sign. And this is a sign of people who are in, innately depressed. And that is something that has also been found uh, by these psychologists. And at this present time, uh, there is now a phase two Allergan trial of botulinum toxin for depression. So we have to ask ourselves, is besides depression, is being beautiful a social advantage? And this is uh, Dr. Al Kligman, the originator of botulinum, uh, the originator of uh, uh, tretinoin, of um, a topical vitamin A. And he certainly believed that, and he published on it and taught on it. And we were grateful to learn from him. But Nancy Etkoff, who's a professor at Harvard, uh, wrote this wonderful book, the, Sci the Survival of the Prettiest, The Science of Beauty. And I totally recommend this as a read because you will understand more why people come to see you. So what do the crowds think? Um, this is a study that was done by Allergan, a Gallup poll in 2002. And if you look at the, the blue and green and put them together, how many people think looking beautiful is somewhat or very important? Uh, it's uh, about 70% of people, sorry. And um, except in Brazil where it's like 90. Um, so now if you're going on a first date, and you haven't done your botulinum toxin, you probably should, or you should certainly read Steve Diane's excellent article on first impression scores with uh, botulinum toxin treated individuals versus uh, toxin naive people. And then the press get back into it again. Natasha Singer in the New York Times, more doctors are turning to the business of beauty. 
And we have to say, yes, but it's more than the business of beauty. It's only possible to have the business of beauty because of the underlying science and the detailed governmental approval processes and of all our national bodies, because otherwise who would know if these were actually reputable, uh, effective or safe. So I think it's really important that we, we um, recognize uh, those bodies. These are just some of the people who have worked with me over the, and Alistair over the many, many years, early adopters, people who, um, people who have done many research trials of their own, uh, just amazing people, I can't thank them enough because it makes going to meetings um, really exciting to hear what uh, everyone else is doing and has learned. Uh, so thank you to all of you. And now I'm just going to turn to Aristotle, the greatest thinker of all. Well, <laughs> he says it better. Beauty is the best letter of introduction. And I completely, completely support that. But beauty through science, because that proves it, what works. And I have to say that neuromodulators, and I've used them all, uh, they've created a new world. They've created a science and a climate that is multi-generational. It also transcends specialties and it transcends uh, treatments. It's an amazing glue that holds our medical world together. So if you have aha moments, and you all will, pursue them with the scientific method. And thank you so much for your attention and for this amazing award. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jean. I um, can't uh, appreciate enough how, you know, challenging it is to share your personal journey. And, you know, you've accomplished so much and we want to acknowledge that with this award. Um, so thank you. And um, you thank still you so have much. lots to contribute for our societies. And, uh, and I think that the most important thing is what, that you said is listen to your aha moment. We all have them. It's really, really true. So many times in clinic, you might see a patient, right? Your patient is teaching you something mm -hmm. or something will pass through your head as you're operating or, you know, there's something, there's always an aha moment. And I think that it's really important for all of us as a community of ophthalmologists to listen to them because sometimes it's hard to listen. Jean, you mentioned some of the challenges you had when, that, uh, when you presented the initial work and people <laughs> said to you, right? I mean, you can share that. It's not easy when someone says to you, that's going nowhere. And look at what you, you and Alistair have contributed to. It's just phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Well, it's been an honor to, and, and a delight uh, throughout. And it's, it's uh, such a gift. It keeps on giving. And I learn from all of you every day. Thanks so much, Fabita. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to uh, go on to uh, introduce our panel, uh, which includes Dr. Fiona Costello, a professor of neuro-ophthalmologist here at the University of Calgary in Alberta. She is an outstanding uh, researcher, contributor. She has a double appointment in neurology and surgery and um, is just a great uh, mentor for us all. Um, and uh, Dr. Jill Foster, who uh, did her med school and residency in Illinois, did her fellowship in Pennsylvania, and um, has also contributed phenomenally in, in publications and presentations to oculoplastics. She was one of the three ASOFERS presidents uh, uh, and um, really, again, is an outstanding mentor. So I'm among superstars here today. And um, I'd like to start off by asking um, you, Jill, uh, if you can tell me if you've had any of these aha moments that Jean is talking about. I just can't hear you. Thank you. I have a, an aha moment to share for our younger um, uh, folks who maybe just be starting in practice. And it was an aha moment that one of my mentors um, gave me, Roger Langston, who was a, a, a inter-segment specialist. When I, was, when I was first in practice, 
I had the habit of at the end of the day, I would have all my charts and then go back through, make sure I didn't forget anything, dictate my letters. And I would spend sometimes two or three hours at night after I finished clinic um, doing cleaning of things up. And Roger Langston saw me sitting there one night and he said, no, Jill, you do the things you need to do when you see the patient. Do them when the patient's there and complete the things that you need to do while you're seeing the patient. It'll go much faster, it'll be more efficient, and you'll be able to go home at night. Um, and that, that was a really important life-changing thing for me in my first few years of, years of practice to try to accomplish what I needed to during the day so that I would have time to go home at night. Yeah, that's a great pearl, right? So finish the paperwork in the room before you leave the patient. And yeah, uh, that saves so much schedule. time. If you need to call another doctor to talk about the patient, if you can, do it, do it while they're in the room um, because it lets you preserve some of your own time in the evenings. Yeah, that's a great aha moment and a pearl. Fiona, can you tell me if you have any aha moments that you can share with us? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Jill's excellent point. For me, um, as I've gotten older, I have aha moments more often. I had an aha moment during Jean's talk and like, I need me some Botox. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom meetings are really humbling and revealing in so many ways. Next time you see me when I sit down, my mouth is going to open. <laughs> but my aha moment actually came in my fellowship because I was sort of thrust into a purely ophthalmology driven environment having just, you know, done my Royal College exams as a neurologist. So I was feeling very insecure, but I began to use uh, optical coherence tomography just way back in 2000. And I decided that I wanted to start using these very cool ophthalmic imaging techniques to better understand brain disease. And I've made a career out of that ever since. So my aha moment really was thinking beyond the obvious and doing the unexpected. And in keeping with um, Jean's theme of crazy, I've been called crazy. <laughs> and uh, my husband has been called crazy for marrying me. <laughs> and ironically, the person who questioned my husband as to why he would marry me because I'm crazy is also a little crazy, <laughs> uh, the neurosurgeon. So I made a whole TED talk about crazy. And I have learned over 50 years that the crazier someone thinks your idea is, the more likely it is to be successful. And so I always get, you know, my spidey senses start tingling when everyone drops the C-bomb. I don't mean that C-bomb, I mean the crazy bomb. And uh, I get excited about the possibilities that are going to come from that. Yeah, I think that's really true, Fiona. Um, just like that video we started with, right? Like, bring it on. This is my crazy panel. I love it. Embrace the crazy. That's actually, that's actually the success point, right? When you feel that aha moment and nobody likes your idea, it's okay. Just keep going. And I love that about, um, about all of you. So we're going to go to the next panel question. Um, greatest challenge you've encountered? So um, it's a hard question. And I know I'm asking you to, to share it publicly. And we are going to be videoed, or we are being videoed. So <laughs> why don't you start us off, Fiona? I would say, um, you know, between me and 149 professional colleagues and friends, I'll limit the scope of my revelation, but my greatest professional sort of uh, challenge came for me when I finished my Royal College, you know, exams, and I went from being, you know, at the zenith I felt of my neuro knowledge, um, a Canadian pregnant Mary to basically, you know, four weeks later in the United States with a newborn, um, completely immersed in an ophthalmology environment, feeling like I hadn't even gone to medical school and trying to climb out of that sort of hole of insecurity um, in what wasn't a terribly hospitable first year um, because I think they were waiting for me to kind of cop out and live down to expectations because I was a new mom. And so I think everything that sort of comes since has been easier not because the circumstances are easier, but just because that experience made me better armed for future battles. So that was my biggest challenge. It's a great one. Yeah, being a mom actually is such a positive experience 
but it helps you um, just be better yeah. all the time. That's what I really think. It just, uh, sometimes when I feel like I want to yell at something, I think, oh, I have to use my mom voice. No, it's okay. We're going to go back to <laughs> just a calm moment, right? Um, what about you, uh, Jill? Can you comment about uh, your greatest challenge that you've had to encounter? I think my greatest, my greatest professional challenge was um, being in a practice situation where my um, crazy ideas were not compatible with what my chairman's ideas um, were, or I, I, the way I wanted my life and my practice to go didn't um, professionally align with how someone who had con more control of my professional progress went and having to make a decision to change careers in order to continue on the pathway that I wanted. And that's a very, leaving a, a job that you love and colleagues that you love, but doing that because you've, you've met a wall and what you can accomplish professionally and having to jump off that cliff and change um, was, was difficult um, for me. Yeah, that's a hard one just recognizing the moment and choosing a different path, right? I think that's a really important one. Um, I wanna encourage all of our attendees. I know that we have hundred over 150 people in attendance this morning, um, that if you have any questions for our panel, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen and just type it in please and we'll see it. And while you guys are thinking of your questions, I'm gonna just ask, um, Jean, if you want to comment on maybe the greatest challenge you feel that you've encountered. Well, I think uh, there's, there's so many of them, <laughs> but I'm going to pick the first, the first real one. And that's when I, um, I finished medical school uh, and went to London, England. I went to London to do ophthalmology at, at Moorfields. But I had to, in order to get accepted at Moorfields, I had to do the primary fellowship in surgery, which has a 15% pass rate. And then I, so I passed that. And then I was the first woman on the house at Moorfields for about 20 years. Uh, so it was really a male culture. And if you look at all the, the, the resident photographs, it's all men. And then there's one little, one little girl <laughs> in the front row. Um, so that was... Um, that was, I had grown up in a, my family. My mother is a doctor, as was my father. They were both specialists. So I didn't think there was anything different about a woman being a specialist. Uh, but obviously um, other people hadn't had the same upbringing. So it was, it was wonderful to, uh, to actually have to work so hard to uh, show people that it's okay, women are okay. You know, and now at Moorfields, they have over 50% female residents. So it's, uh, it's really, but that was my, that was quite a shock. Um, plus um, driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we have a question here. Um, how can a rising female ophthalmologist combat the leaky pipeline, the phenomenon that whereby women tend to take on less leadership positions? So um, would you like to take that on, Fiona? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I think it's interesting. I was contemplating, I think it's a great question. You know, uh, when I sort of started my career, even up until pretty recently, I actually doubted my leadership abilities because I didn't feel that I subscribed to a conventional norm. Like my role models were not people that I respected them as leaders, but I didn't feel that I shared the same skill sets. I didn't think that I was necessarily cut out for the job and I didn't put myself forward for leadership positions. And sometimes because I'm outspoken and I'm brash and more than a little crazy, um, I think I've been dissuaded from leadership positions by people who want to maintain the status quo. And when you're younger, you fall for that. Like you think that somebody knows better than you. It's a little like being a little bit like being a resident, like you're insecure yourself and you assume someone else knows best. But now that I've gotten older, I think that's exactly what we need in leadership. We need people who are balancing more than one portfolio, be it academic, be it 
a business portfolio, a family portfolio. We need people who are successful across multiple spheres of life. That is a skill set that medicine does not cultivate. It teaches us to be narcissistically myopic with a bitemporal hemianopsia focused solely on validation through our work, which is not a long-term success strategy for life. <laughs> well spoken like a neurologist. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Very well spoken. We need to assume we can do it, ask for it, and get good at it, and seek feedback. I think uh, women are often collaborative leaders, and that brings beautiful harmony often to groups that lack it. You can't be successful without harmony. You've got a peloton all riding in the wrong direction. Uh -huh. can, can I make a comment, Femita? Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the, um, I think that that question is one of the very best questions. And I, I have been proud to be part of an organization called the Future Leaders Network, uh, which is the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery. And we take our young dermatologists who are five years and under out of uh, residency. And for a whole year, we teach them. We have webinars every single month. There's tons of work they have to do. And they have to take a whole, a whole concept and boil it down to present at the annual meeting in under two minutes. And that focuses them like I've never seen. And now oh, I'm surprised because it's now about 10, 12 years old. This, this, and now these young people are on the board. They understand how to do it. It takes people 10 years to figure these things out. So why not help them um, hit the ground running. So I think that's something that women in ophthalmology could do for women in op young women in ophthalmology is have um, a, a, a group like that, a future leaders group, um, because it just is magical to see them develop. It's a great idea. I think that, uh, you know, I was talking yesterday in our Canadian Ophiel Plastics business meeting with Yvonne Mulgat, who was the previous president, and I said that we almost need a leadership development program mm -hmm. for Canadian ophthalmologists. Yeah. I know they have an LDP program, Jill, in the U.S., and um, I know some, um, some, some people who have been successful in doing that, but I do think that there are certain skills, as you said, Fiona, that are specific for leadership that we may not have been groomed to just in the way we were brought up culturally or just in what was expected to, for us. And maybe it's an LDP program that we need for all our residents. I think actually it's better because the future leader, as you said, Jean, is, is different. It's a different, de if we need a different leader if we want a different future. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. I just want to, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, and I have just a last question to ask all of you before we thank our sponsors and take our evaluation poll. So key pearls to achieve success. So I'm going to ask you, Jill, to share with us three pearls that you have to uh, achieve success and three pearls that you would, you know, tell your fellow before they went on and launched their career. Go ahead, Jill. I think, I think Jean um, already gave us one, which is um, work harder than everyone else um, and don't leave any stone unturned. Just make sure that um, no one can criticize your work product based on any of your features, be it your femininity or, or anything else. Um, just prove yourself and do that when you're young and you have the energy and when you're making your reputation. Um, seek out leadership positions. And I think that our previous question um, goes to that, that go to your mentors, go to your societies, go to your institution and volunteer for committees um, and uh, leadership roles to, to further your career. And go to meetings, go to meetings, network, meet people, um, and, you know, find the names, find the person who wrote the paper that you really admired, go up and introduce yourself and see how they think as a, a young professional to, to see how they've made it to where they are. Excellent. Excellent. Fiona? Okay, yeah, I, um, I think that I would say my answer would be three things. One is to be curious, the second is to be bold, and the third is to be generous. So by curious, I mean, you want to be a person who is constantly seeking to learn, whatever that is, whatever your practice, whatever your discipline, 
Everybody loves being around good energy and you, you bring energy to others, you get energy back. So follow something that drives you, be interested. Um, then be bold. So don't be afraid to take risks, a butt convention. If somebody tells you you're crazy, that's probably the exact reason to do something. Uh, don't let where you think you trained, um, whether you have children or not, who you married, who you didn't marry, don't let those things get in your way. Be bold. And then be generous. So when you reach the age of kind of climbing up the hill constantly, you know, and trying to get ahead, it doesn't help younger people if you don't share some of that, you know, expertise, share some of those journey kind of lessons and help those around you. I mean, by elevating those around you, you get a lot of energy back and you can glean so much from young learners and from young people. So curious, bold, generous. Love that. Curious, bold, generous. Jean, anything to add? Well, they, um, I have to say that Jill and Fiona are a superb, uh, superb description of what makes for success. I would only add that I try to be very positive uh, all the time to everybody um, because I find that, um, you know, sugar works a lot better than vinegar. Um, and I also think that you have to lead by example. Because like when, you know, you raise your kids, your kids do not do what you tell them to. Your kids do what you do. So I exercise every day. I, and I, you know, and I know that my patients have started doing this. I ex uh, exercise um, um, and um, I listen to people. That's what I, I think those are, um, listening to people is something that, uh, a lot of people are just on send, and actually, I, I learned a lot from all of you today, and I thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you all. It's been such a lovely hour uh, learning from your personal journey, uh, Jean. I really felt it was heartfelt, you know, and uh, I think the value of, of all of us in Canada is that we are a smaller community. And so it actually gives us a chance even more to reach out and support each other, right? Mm -hmm. Just in this time that we're on this Zoom, I've already received texts saying, oh, I love this. And let's keep, let's, uh, let's have Fiona's quote in writing for our <laughs> next, uh, next uh, WIO <laughs> session. So um, I think it's really important that we can um, work together, strengthen our community and collaborate more with our partners in the US, which is just like our sisters and you know, all, of, all over the world. I mean, the world is open for us. So I wanna thank you all for sharing your experience here today. I really appreciate it. Jill, Fiona, Jean, excellent. And uh, I wanna thank all of you who tuned in for our amazing WIO session here with the Canadian Ophthalmology Society. Such a privilege to be part of it.